Global Virtual Book Club. Uh, today we are actually in our episode 3. And the last few episodes we visited like Singapore, Australia. The previous episode we went all the way to LA and California. <laughs> and today we are back in, well, California again, LA. And we were supposed to have a special guest from London, but she'll be joining us again probably in the, in the next other episode. So um, for those who are new to this, my name is Charmaine Tan. I'm the author of Cyber Risk Leaders and also the founder of Cyber Risk Meetups. And uh, my day job is executive advisor at Privasec, which is an Australian cybersecurity company where we do a lot of um, GRC, rate teaming, pen testing sort of work. Um, I really work closely with the CISOs to help them bridge their business gaps across APAC. And today I have with me my lovely co-host and dear friend, Carmen Marsh. Carmen Marsh, do you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. So I am Carmen Marsh and I'm the CEO of Intelligenza. Um, and I'm also founder of 100 Women in 100 Days Cybersecurity Career Accelerator and Cyber Security Woman of the Year Awards. This is episode three. Um, I am excited because we, we always pick a topic or a section in a book or a quote um, and then uh, we invite the, the guests uh, and so we can go, you know, just a dive deeper in, in uh, some of the some of the content of the book, which is, of course, you're the author of the book, Cyber Risk Leaders. And it's a great collection of, of insights from all the CISOs and, and cybersecurity experts across the world. So anybody who doesn't have it, um, you should get a copy. Excellent. Do you want to let our guest introduce herself? Adriana, are you there? I, yes. Okay, sure. Um, I am Adriana Sanford, and I am the founding director of the OU Global Risk and Threat Series, which is a leadership forum uh, through the University of Oklahoma. I'm also a senior fellow with the OU Center for Intelligence and National Security, and the assistant director of executive ed programs for the uh, the business school. The Michael F. Price Business School. And in addition to that, I have several other roles. I'm an international TV commentator mm. and a former senior counsel for a Fortune 500 company. Very, very nice. Nice. And today we're going to be talking about some really interesting topics. Carmen, do you want to tell our listeners what we'll be discussing? Yes, one of the things that uh, we wanted to talk about today. So in the last episode, we talked about all the different things and all the different risks that um, that we um, that we were uh, you know experiencing during the COVID nineteen, and uh, you know obviously uh, some of the things um, that we could do possibly to uh, protect ourselves. And so in this um, episode, I wanted to touch a little bit about. Um, you know, how it is now that things are going back to normal. People are starting to go back to their offices. Um, you know, some of the companies um, are actually bringing everybody back. Some of the companies are uh, doing the hybrid situation where, you know, they have perhaps two different groups. And, and so they, they have a schedule, A, B, A, and B, and then bring people back at a different times just to kind of keep the social distancing going. Uh, but regardless of that, what does the world look like today, right? I mean, the world looks so different uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, it hit us suddenly. Everybody had to adjust to the new environment. Um, we did pretty well, I think, across the world. Um, there are still some after effects, and now we're trying slowly going back. So what does that look like? And what do the leaders of the companies have to um, do and pay attention to right so what's the new normal and and let's talk about the empathy i know that was one of the things that you had in your book uh Shemaine, um how important it is for the cso's or, or really any business leaders any you know executives yeah. um you know to to bring that empathy you know to to their people to to the employees and adriana had a lot to say about that so what do you think adriana well do you want me to start or it doesn't matter either way or just I'll go for Adriana. Sure. The you know, if if we back up and we take a look at what happened, this was so quickly that we really didn't understand what was gonna happen. We just had all our workers go home 
And something like 75% of those that were working from home accessed files using unprotected devices. And about 40% of those working from home said they didn't really have the appropriate policies for working remotely. And, and what does that mean? That means policies with regards to, you know, when you work, uh, what is expected of you, and, you know, policies outlining the employee's expectations, you know, prioritizing security, safeguarding the company's liability. All of this was missing, and it made it a little bit challenging for management. And, of course, you know, the board was very concerned. I think if we take a look at what's happened since then, you know, there's there have been some changes, and a lot of companies, so there, were, there are those companies that basically – they were not prepared and the employees did not have the training on how to gather and access the company data and, and products were bought off the shelf. And, and, and now we're going to start to see the, the effects of that. And as we go forward uh, over the next few months and people are starting to return to work, we're going to uh, see how all of this plays out. Um, it's, we're seeing a lot of lawsuits, a lot of class actions in all sorts of areas because of COVID. And um, depending on the industry, you know, you're going to you're going to have different challenges. Financial industry, banking, you know, the banking sector, you, you couldn't really access hard copies uh, to do due diligence. That was a challenge, um, you know, but yet you have to do your due diligence. So you've got all these different issues. And now when you get back to work, if you do get back to work, uh, in an office, you're going to have to go back through and, and, and figure out where exactly your challenges lie. And it depends on the company. It depends on how much they had in place before we started and and basically how much training was there. Yeah. And so the leaders really, the leaders of the company, it's not only they have to worry about the, the policies and, and returning, you know, bringing everybody back from, from financial, financial perspective, from the, uh, you know, privacy and security perspective, from, you know, so many aspects, right? But there's also the human side, because I think people are, are scared, right? People are still scared because of what we've gone through. Um, and we, I think we all just kind of, oh, this is now it feels at home, it feels safe. So what it's going to look like when I go back to the office, right? So I think it's really challenging for all the leaders. I mean, from all the areas um, for the leaders. So, so, I mean, what, what would you, Adriana, what would you think a good leader would do? Uh, not only, of course, from, from business perspective, but from people perspective, you know, what would it look like? Well, I, I, I think the big issue there is the fact that you have to realize um, that this affects people differently and there is a lot of stress and you need to learn or know how to basically spot uh, these challenges because not everybody's going to tell you what's going on. So, you know, you've got to try to figure out who is secretly struggling and do some emotional triage. I mean, that's going to be those that basically are able to really um, dive deeply into, uh, you know, their employees, uh, you know, how they're feeling um, mm. are really going to be the ones that are successful. You've got to pay attention to, you know, whose energy is up, you know, um, who's performing. Are they able to manage their workload? There's yeah. going to be a lot of different clues and you really have to pay attention and, you know, and maybe ask your employees, how are you coping with frustration? Uh, you know, there's so much going on and you've got to really be compassionate and, and, and know their limits and don't push because this is a really, really difficult time for people. Yes. Very, it very is very true. And yeah, and I think the good leader uh, would definitely have worked really hard throughout this last few weeks mm -hmm. right already establishing the trust because i think what's gonna uh, what's gonna happen i think it's important to have the trust you know with your, your employees um to uh, to to make them more comfortable right so they feel safe and and they know that you have your best 
interest in mind. I mean, you have their be best interest in mind, right? That's super important. And um, so that hopefully the good leaders have been building this up throughout the weeks. <laughs> yeah. I, think yeah. well, and I, think, I think, Carmen, if you don't have that and you create a toxic combination where somebody does not feel safe, you're going to have burnout. People mm -hmm. are going to leave. People are not going to function and you're going to have some other challenges. You know, the, the, the big concern that I see right now is there are those that are ready to go back to work. Um, and then there are those that are being forced to go back to work. And those are the ones that concern me the most because in some sectors, uh, you're required to go back to work because the company is losing money. You know, one of those sectors is academia. Professors need to go back to work because if they do this remotely, even though they may be able to do it, the students, the parents may ask for some of the refund, you know, for, for the tuition. So right. professors are told they must go back in some universities. And I'm, I'm not speaking about my university and, and anything that we do talk about here. Obviously, we're not talking as lawyers or, or giving legal advice. It's just general information. But the, the concern is uh, we have protection for pregnancy. We have we have temporary disability out there, but temporary disability does not cover these types of situations where you may have a baby boomer, uh, an elderly person that's not feeling comfortable about returning. I don't, it doesn't matter what you're saying you're going to do. Okay, social distancing, the deaths are this far apart. Um, particularly if we're talking about teaching, you know, students do mingle and putting a professor in that kind of a situation can, can make it very, very stressful. And it's it's something that needs to be considered. And I think in a lot of different industries and in a lot of different sectors, you're going to have employers that are requiring or requesting those employees to come back or retire. And what we have to think about is if we ask them to retire, are they ready? Are these baby boomers going to be OK? How is that going to affect our economy? Mm. Yeah, very true. Um, I think we'll we'll be fine, but this is a transition, you know. And I think everybody needs to be aware uh, aware of it, right? We need to be very careful. We 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 have to have empathy. Yeah. We have to be uh, sympathetic to to people's feelings, um, and just work with them, you know, to slowly bring them back and, and make them feel comfortable. And that that that's what the good leader would do. Yes. Exactly. Well, and that's the reputation of the company. And if you have a good leader and a good company that goes a long way because everyone is looking right now we've got a crisis and 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 the way you act will you know go a long way yeah and you know another thing is i think people are, are afraid to make decisions because there's a lot of uncertainty right mm -hmm. so it's uh, I mean, am I writing? I mean, they're, they're questioning their, their themselves, right? Am I making the right decision for the company? Am I am I am I doing the right thing? What what it's going to look like? What's uh, what situation going to look like two months from now, right? So so I think uh, employees are looking. People are looking for strong leaders that will make decisions and be confident and tell them, you know, everything's going to be fine. But be realistic, right? Don't don't make it, don't don't paint that rosy picture. <laughs> You have to be realistic, but uh, but be confident and, and have a plan, you know, and that's uh, that's another important thing um, to, to think about. But, yeah. Yeah, no, I really agree with what you guys say, because it's really important to put ourselves in their shoes. And as industry leaders, it's very easy for you to focus on what other business needs. Right. And then, you know, um, like there's so many examples I've been seeing about for example, you know, us needing to come in and do like a crisis management workshop or training. But then sometimes we forget to think about the people who are doing the training and the people who are receiving the training. Are they OK with coming back into the environment? Uh, and everyone is different. There's different individuals with different sort of risk that they are willing to take. And as Adriana mentioned earlier, right, about some of them, it depends on the family unit that you belong to. If you're working, you're with a lot of elderly folks, maybe their appetite for risk is going to be very, very low and they wouldn't want to even come back to the workforce where they're going to be physically um, close to even their colleagues. So it's about really trying to understand how everyone for everyone, their situation is different. 
Um, also, you know, what spectrum are they at when it comes to some of them could be really an introvert, some of them could be an extrovert. And, and you know, the introverts are so used to now working in home, they have a different yes. mindset <laughs> and coming back to the, the world suddenly it's going to take a bit of adjustment for them as well. So yeah, I think as an industry, we can be more nurturing. And as long as we have that empathy and put ourselves in their shoes, rather than just going straight ahead with what we think is the right thing to do, then at least that helps to make it a lot more collaborative in how we are approaching things. I, I, think, you make a valid, I think you make a very valid point. And I think what we're going to see over the next couple months is as people start to transition, we may find that the workforce may have forever changed for the better. And maybe people are more productive at home. And maybe once companies are taking a look at this, they'll say, wow, the time that we're saving commuting, you know, there are fewer distractions from coworkers mm. or fewer meetings and bringing them back might not have been the best thing. And, and, and not to mention those employees who maybe you cut 20% of their salary because you've gone through this are going to start looking at other companies that maybe will allow them to go back home, have a healthier lifestyle and, mm -hmm. and will be even more productive. So heads up, if you're forcing your employees to go back and you are cutting their salaries, there may be another place that offers them a better situation where they actually can be more productive. Yeah, this is one case where the pandemic situation is actually helping to drive transformation faster. It than is, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It is a transformation. And I, I think a lot of companies that had a policy where every every employee had to be at the office before, sort of in the old fashioned way, right? Um, I think they may be changing their mind. If they, they cannot adjust, I think like Adriana was saying, uh, they're going to leave because they're going to go somewhere else where they can have a little better flexible schedule where they can sometimes work from home, sometimes they're at office, but you know, so they're going to be looking for a different uh, work setup, I think, working environment. So, so hopefully most companies can adjust to this new, uh, you know, just new way of working that we've proved now that we can do. Right. <laughs> well, and, and so that's, was, that's yeah. exactly the point, Carmen. We've proved it because had this pandemic lasted a couple weeks, we would have been right back on the horse. But yes. what's happened is we've had several months, and in those months, we've learned to adjust to regular irregular work hours. You know, so that both people in the house maybe can use devices at different times, and you know, we've learned. Uh, how to go about living and working and being productive from home. And that was a hard lesson to learn, but we've had enough time to where we finally figured out what works um, and what's proper. And that training has come at a very high cost, I think. Mm -hmm. But we've had enough time to play with this that now we're starting to realize we like it. We like it and we may not want to go back, right? Right. <laughs> you see more people <laughs> enjoying life and enjoying relationships and, and more time at home. I mean, you know, I, I do believe that there is a certain amount of time you should spend in the office, depending on the profession that you're yeah. in. But the amount of time that people were away from home, you know, I really think that uh, this this pandemic has given a lot of people the opportunity to see a different world mm. and to actually uh, have the time to think about what they want. Yeah, very true. Yeah. And in the long hours of commute, right? That's another thing. I mean, mm -hmm. if you think about it, you could actually work those those two hours. For I know a lot of people, including um, some of the projects that, that I've been on, I would have to drive an hour each way. Wow. you know, to, to the office and back. And that's two hours of my day on top of the, the you know, eight hours, nine hours. So that makes it a really long day. And I think a lot of other people would, you know, experience the same thing. And now they're saying, well, I can actually either put that time into being healthy and do some, you know, or maybe do some workout, do some exercise, you know, you know, do some something for themselves instead of sitting in a car, right, for two hours. So anyway, there's um, going to be a lot of those kind of things coming up. Yeah. Like, um, on one hand, yes, we need to be really, um, it's important to have the balance still, because I find that sometimes when we work too much from home, 
you know, you get comfortable as well, right? You get lazy instead of going out, you're just staying at home. And what happens is that you tend to just resort to working more hours <laughs> because there's nothing else. Oh my do. gosh, that that is so true, Shemay. Oh, and then, but wait, wait, I think that's because online. of the shelter in place. Sorry. I got to take that into consideration that we can't go out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, but if I want to bring this conversation to a different level now, when we talk about empathy, right? And earlier we talked about the individuals and as industry leaders, but I think one good example where like the government is showing that they actually understand, um, like even just cyber criminals, right? How they think. I just saw in the news um, the other day, like NCA, the UK's National Crime Agency, they launched a new advertising campaign where they want to really divert young people who are searching for cyber crime services to white hat alternatives, which I thought is really good because they're aware that, you know, there's a lot more people who are free now, they have nothing to do, they might be, yes. or they're out of jobs. So it's easier for them to, you know, turn bad maybe and look to other means to try and support themselves. So it's nice to know that government or, you know, people are trying to think of ways to still offer them support, but help them on the right path. So that's a, a really good example. You guys have anything to share to that? Yeah, I think this this is a really good time to to actually support those kind of initiatives. Definitely, think that's worth you know exploring and uh, and bring it you know yeah different country, different different cities. I think that would be a good uh, spend time for for those that are just either finding themselves without internship, without a job, you know, out of college. Um, you know, put them on the right path, put them to do something really good, you know, that helps everyone, right? Yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. The nice thing, though, is that people will be understanding, employers will be understanding if these students, you know, if, if our youth, you know, do not have an internship, do not have a job, it's something that everybody can relate to. And I think, you know, we're at a point now where if somebody, if we see a resume with a big blank, you're, you know, you're not going to have to ask a lot of questions. Uh, I think yeah. it's interesting the way that the government have stepped in to try to deal with the um, mm. the tracing and the tracking of the pandemic. And depending, yeah. you know, there's some countries where they're more restrictive, uh, mm -hmm. like Belgium and France and the Netherlands. And, you know, they, they're very careful. There are other ones that are really adopting um, you know, techniques and apps to try to, yes. uh, to track it. Mm. Um, you know, there have been talks with Apple and Google on contract uh, tracing technology and Germany, France, um, Austria were, you know, talking about their own con uh, contact tracing app. Tracing app. Yeah. So it's a very interesting time. It is. And uh, there's lots of debate as well about privacy, right? And security and, and so many other. What, what, are, what are your thoughts when it comes to this? Well, one of the things that uh, Adriana, um, you know, that's her, actually her expertise, you know, and one of the expertise. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's privacy, and and I know Adriana, you and I talk about the GDPR earlier. I know you're teaching classes in GDPR, and we we um, we hope to have Lisa here because I know she she could do, tell us the first hand how um, how sh how you know UK is experiencing mm -hmm. uh, G GDPR now. This has been in in effect for a couple of years, and I know that California has and US have um, we have some privacy laws, nothing like GDPR. Um, but um, um, it would be good to see how it worked even prior to pandemic and then um, and also what happened during the pandemic, right? Were there any changes? Were there any looser laws or, or you know, stricter laws, you know, associated with GDPR or what, what's actually happened? But since she, she's not here, um, we'll just go straight to Adriana and she, ca she can tell us a little bit about um, prior uh, perhaps GDPR, um, you know, experience sure, and, and sure. you know, all the things that you've, you know, you've been teaching people, right, about GDPR, because there's yeah, a lot of things sure. that people don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I do you want me, I can, I can back up to when we first started with GDPR, if you want. I mean, GDPR started in May 2018, and before that, there was a European directive. Uh, the directive was not binding 
on the countries. They were basically guidelines which created a patchwork system, kind of like we have a patchwork system in this country. And the GDPR was meant to streamline everything. And so people are pretty excited about it. What I will tell you, fast forward to today, there's a lot of issues with GDPR because even though all, it's binding on all the countries, enforcement is very, very different. And mm -hmm. different countries have regulators are active in some, not so active in others, and they go after different violations. So you really, if you are working in Europe, you really, depending on your industry and depending on which countries, you really need to study and map out and see because pay attention to who is actually active and what are the most common violations and say, hey, is this something that I'm actually doing? So it's not across the board. The treatment of GDPR uh, in Europe and all of these variations thereof, uh, depending on the country and, 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 and your location, you're going to have something different uh, to look at, a different type of risk, a different focus. Now, with regards, if we take a step back and we talk about that tracing and the contract, the, um, the, uh, the contact tracing and the privacy issues with GDPR in place, and I can kind of go over what GDPR is, but basically there were a lot of carve outs uh, for this pandemic and a lot of, depending on the countries, and I'm telling you, they are all different. There were different approaches to how they would go about uh, with this contact tracing and, you know, different countries develop different apps. Italy, for example, it, the Italian government issued a voluntary contact tracing app and it would be anonymous. And all that data that they collected would be destroyed by the end of the year. This is the way they decided to deal with it. And this way they felt that they were going to comply with the privacy requirements in the GDPR. So that's one approach. If you take a look at like um, Poland, Poland had gone further. They actually had self-quarantine. And with Poland, with their app, their app was intended to actually check on individuals who were ordered to self-quarantine. And those individuals were required to submit their personal information and a, uh, send a photo in a timely basis so that they could show where they were. And that's a very, very different approach. And those that did not, they were uh, basically fined uh, because they were breaking the quarantine. So what we see around the world is depending on the country, there's different approaches, there's different views on what is permissible under a pandemic. Um, and it's, uh, it's interesting, it's, it's, it's very interesting. If you want, I can go through what the GDPR is. I don't know if everybody knows, you know, the, the basics of the GDPR, but um, or we can we can jump ahead. We can uh, do a really quick um, overview and then jump straight ahead. OK, all right. All right. OK, so GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation was meant to be a one stop shop before we had the GDPR. There was a patchwork system because under the directive, which was created, you know, when the Internet in the mid 1990s, uh, basically before everything evolved. And that's what they had in place with the directive. And the patchwork system was not working well because if there was a breach and you were working in several different countries, you would have to notify every one of those countries of the breach. And you had to keep up with the laws of all those countries. And it was a very, very tedious and uh costly uh, situation for our multinationals and for the legal department. So the idea was that with the GDPR, we would have a binding regulation on all these EU countries, and we would be able to tell our multinational, okay, this is the law and this is what we need to do. The one-stop shop, in the event there is a breach, we are going to tell you which country you have to go ahead and report that breach. And guess what? They're going to report it to all the others. So it's going to make it a lot easier. You don't have to jump to every country where you're doing business. Now, that could be different for Carmen as it could be for me, even though we are working in the same countries because they have to kind of split up uh, the different countries and the authorities as to, you know, who's going to be taking the breaches. Otherwise, one country is going to get inundated. 
So the one-stop shop seemed very, very appropriate. Uh, the 72-hour notice, so you couldn't take too long after the breach happened because we had an issue with the banks really suffering when companies do not notify of the breach. You know, mm -hmm. before it was like in the United States, depending on the on the on the state, some companies would take a week, some would take a month, and say we really want to verify, we wanted to investigate, and that really affects the banks that are trying on the other end to mitigate their costs because their customers are losing money and, and, and you know, all the fraud. So the 72 hour notice was really good. Uh, there was also in the GDPR, a request for certain companies, big multinationals need a data protection officer. Mm -hmm. That's not your compliance person. That's not your legal person. This person, the data protection officer is going to deal with violations, with regulations, with the right uh, to be forgotten, deleting things, you know, all that information. So this is a brand new position and it was really, really attractive. And if if you don't know what you want to do in life, this is a great place where you're probably going to have a job for life. Uh, we had privacy by design. Privacy by design basically says if you're creating something new, you've got to think of privacy. Don't leave that out because it's going to be an issue. So uh, privacy by default, make sure all your defaults, you're always thinking whenever you've got those defaults that they're at the highest level to protect people's privacy, people's data. And then, of course, you've got the right to be forgotten. And that right to be forgotten says that certain information is old and it is going to hurt us in some way. And you know what? We can get rid of it. There's really no relevant reason to keep it around. Now, these concepts on their face may seem very, very basic. And you can say, okay, I got it. I understand it. I can go forward. But that's not the case. What happened is depending on the country that you're dealing with, mm. uh, laws have evolved in different ways. And just because something's accepted in one country, that same issue may not be accepted somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I can give you some examples where really in Europe you see issues for our companies. Um, one of them, which is kind of shocking, is this um, the right to be forgotten. What does this mean? Forgotten for what? Is it, let's say, uh, does that cover links? When you do a Google search and things pop up, if I do a Google search on Carmen and it says professional tennis player and all this good stuff and then something negative, does it cover that? Well, depending on the country, some say, no, that's an algorithm. That doesn't matter. Other countries, and, and that would be Germany. Germany was like, well, those are algorithms. It's not really the company. It's not Google's fault. Australia said it does matter. Those algorithms have to be checked and you have to make sure that the content that's being provided <clears throat> is not defamatory in nature. Now, this is an interesting concept. And how did this come about in Australia? Well, there was an individual that was in the wrong place at the wrong time mm. and ended up that there was some kind of an underworld situation. I think it was a restaurant. Make a long story short, there were articles about what had happened there. And he was not part of that, but his name came up with it. And as time went on, what happens? People continue to click. I know that Carmen is a tennis player. I know that Carmen did this. But you know what? People click on what they say. Ooh, there's some gossip. What's that? And all of a sudden, that rises to the top. So this poor man was linked to the underworld and a whole bunch of terrible things, which he went and he fought. And, and the court system said, this is right. You've got to make sure that you're not going to defame somebody. And this needs to needs to go away. Now, that concept, if you take a look at the right to be forgotten in the UK, right? In the UK, yeah. the right to be forgotten has gone much further. Let's say the person actually did something wrong. Let's say the person did something wrong 10 years ago. Well, how would you deal with that, Carmen? Would you delete it? If the person was a criminal and now they want that record deleted. Yeah. How would you deal with that? Would you delete it or would you say no? That remains. Yeah. Well, that that's the thing. I mean, it's how do you reconcile well, this, right? It's, you can't. And this is the problem. Because in the UK, the judge ruled that this man 
felt sorry and had changed his life and should have a second chance. So they ruled in favor, even though he had done something wrong, time was, it was time to get rid of it. Now, what does it create? Basically, this tells us that these are going to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis, which is huge. What does that mean for our tech companies? It means a lot of litigation. Do you know how many people came forward after that ruling? Everybody who did something wrong is like, hey, I want to show and I want my record cleared. So this is what I'm talking about. Depending on the country, the way we deal with these issues, are going to it's going to be very, very different. It is, and I can see so much, so many challenges um, with this, and um, that's why I, I wanted to to hear Lisa. I see Lisa's online, but I don't know if we can hear her. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> what time it's is really early, early. Lisa? Is um, it? It's four fifty-two. Oh, oh my! God. <laughs> Did I? Was it? Sorry, I do apologise. Was it four a.m. here or five? Because I had it in. It came in for five a.m. So that's why. I, but I guess um, you're quite underway. <laughs> Yes, we are almost done here. We thought that just maybe something happened, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. We were just talking, Lisa, about GDPR and wanted to um, get your take. My name's Lisa. I'm from the UK Cybersecurity Association, and we're a um, trade body that supports individuals and organizations that work um, actively within the cybersecurity industry. <laughs> Happy to have you. Yeah, I appreciate you making it even though it's so crazy early hours for you. So maybe, well, well it's good timing because if not, we would have um, ended the session without being able to hear from you. So maybe if you can just share with the rest of the listeners then like, um, you know, anything you want to add specifically when it comes to, you know, what Carmen mentioned already about privacy. Um, things that you've been seeing and observing from your own experiences and things that people should be aware of? Um, over here, we have the um, Information Commissioner's Office that's supposed to uh, deal with GDPR breaches or right to be forgotten requests and so on. And an interesting thing that I've seen in the last few weeks is that they've effectively downed tools almost because of the pandemic and um, nobody can get hold of them. Nobody can seem to get through to to them. And um, there's a whole discussion going on here about with the ICO of um, stop doing what they're doing. Who's policing GDPR now? What's what's happening? What's what, what's going on with if they're not kind of there to do that? Um, you know, what does that mean for um, for GDPR over here moving forward? So there's that whole big discussion you know, here that I'm seeing that that's quite interesting. And also I came across an article that in California, they're rolling out something quite so or attempting to roll out something quite similar. I don't know if you guys have heard that over there, um, but certainly those are some of the things that I'm seeing at the, at, at the moment with regard to GDPR. Yeah, I'm actually in California. Yeah. That's the yeah. CCPA, that's our law. Yeah. And yeah. that law is 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 out. Uh, it it's supposed to be enforceable now. Um, mm -hmm. It came out. It took effect January first. And the difference is that only covers California residents. We don't know if we're going to have other states and you know maybe federal legislation follow. But it's the California Consumer Privacy Act, and uh, it's it's a high level of protection of data protection. They, some people call it a mini GDPR. I would mm. say it's a little bit different. Um, definitely what we see as private information is different. It's broader than the GDPR. The GDPR covers your social security, your, you know, all your, 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 uh, your name, your, your, your emails and things like that. The, the CCPA actually covers much, much more. It covers uh, what if, it basically allows for the right to know what's being collected on you, what is being sold, what's, and, uh, and you can refuse and say, no, I don't want this information out there. 
Now you have a right to access it, but what do you have a right to access? It's not only what you purchased. It's what Carmen decided to put in her bag and was going mm -hmm. to purchase and then took it out. Right. It's the ad that she was looking and she clicked on. So things that you could have purchased and you didn't, which I had no idea that the sweater mm -hmm. I put in my bag and then decided I didn't like, has been documented somewhere. So it's my attitude about something. It's my tendency. It's my history of what I usually purchase. All that information is actually covered under the CCPA. So it goes a lot further. It's very, mm -hmm. very interesting because even though it's one state, um, if you think about it, the we have one of the largest economies out there. So one in eight Americans are actually going to be affected, uh, protected under this. And it is broad in scope in the same way as the GDPR, meaning any company that's doing business with the uh, California can fall under this. See, that's, um, you know, a lot of times uh, I feel like when we, uh, when we, uh, you know, uh, come up with a new bill or we did with a new law or, or regulation, it's very vague. And sometimes it's, it's almost like I feel like it's on purpose. And I don't know. I mean, <laughs> Diana, you could probably speak to that better. But it's like you, you almost have to have a translator. I mean, it's a whole bunch of, you know, language there, but it's mm. so vague. So it, it leaves a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, ways to, you know, to to translate that or, or understand that. Well, that's just it. And you're absolutely right. Just like the GDPR, the CCPA is going to be difficult to implement. So you have to undertake an assessment and you really need to integrate this into the business and you need to start your mapping. And just because you're compliant with GDPR, heads up, CCPA is different. Very and, true. And, you know, Very I, true. I, I, guess I think the another huge uh, point here is that individuals have the right to sue under CCPA in addition to uh, basically a government action of coming after you we actually have a private right of action which means you're going to see a lot of class actions if there is a breach basically there's a private right of action to collect that's pretty scary uh, Andrea, do you see a lot of that already happening at the moment? Like people actually taking actions? There have been some. Uh, March 9th, there was one that came out. Um, you're starting to see them. I, they're going to be popping up. Yes, there's going to be, there's incentive. There's a reason to do this. Mm. And it's, it's, you know, lawyers are going to be out there looking for this. Uh, cases where, you know, people allege, that information should have been deleted and it wasn't and all of a sudden there's a breach you know cases like that are going to be popping up so you got to be ready you got to be protected now remember gdpr only covers things like social security your address your phone number yep. this goes a lot deeper so make sure you you know what information you've got and how you're collecting it and and you have to be ready to give this basically to the individual when they ask you for it yeah. Oh my gosh. There's there uh, there's yeah. There's so much to it, right? We could talk about it forever, forever and ever. It's so interesting. It's truly interesting because you know there's a lot of um, like we were talking about a lot of translation too. I mean, you can read something, but when somebody really is an expert or understands it well, and they can they can actually speak to it in a way that uh, the rest of us can can uh, fully understand, right? It's uh, yeah. it's uh, that's that's really articulated interesting. Articulated it like it's so clear yeah. and concise and all. Yeah. yeah. So we definitely have to make this recording available to everyone because. There's been a lot of questions since the day it started, like uh, even in Australia, right? When GDPR came over and then we had like our Australian um, NDB amendment and things like that. Um, we Yeah, there were a lot of, you know, people trying to understand how can they interpret it, you know, because there's not much historical uh, evidence or ex that they can refer to. And everyone's just learning along the way. But with more examples and with more of this coming to surface, uh, you know, people are getting better in terms of knowing what they need to uh, look at to adhere to these laws. So just conscious of time because we yes. have, I think this is the longest session we have had because it's really, really interesting. I know. Right? It's, 
Yeah, because it's so interesting. It's so, you know, I love to listen to this because yeah. I, I, I'm learning so much, you know. Uh, but yeah, like you said, we, we should be conscientious of the time. And, and Lisa, join us last. Uh, I don't want to forget about uh, your book. That yes. uh, It's almost out, Lisa. So, so please is. tell us about your yeah. book. Um, so the Rise of the Cyber Women is due out next week. And what I wanted to do with it was compile an inspiring collection of um, stories of women that have had a non-linear journey into the cybersecurity industry. So um, they may have been in a different area or a completely different career like I was. I was in the entertainment industry before I was in cybersecurity, um, for example, and then moved um, into it and how they did it and their journey, um, if they overcame any challenges, etc., which I certainly did. And oh my goodness, I've been so inspired by all the submissions that I've had, um, all the chapters that I've read, all the amazing women out there that um, have made the move into the industry. And I think there is a, a, a lot more that can be done to encourage women um, to start a career in cyber. Um, and that's what I'd like the book to do, to be that resource, to you know, be given to somebody that's just taking their first steps, just thinking about it. And, you know, hopefully that will inspire them to think, yes, I can do this. Yes, I can enter the industry. Um, so that was the, um, the, the idea behind the book. Um, and yes, it's due out next week. So I'm really excited wow. about it. <laughs> That's brilliant. It's such a good topic. And, and honestly, more people need to be mm. writing about this yeah. or talking about this. So it's really mm. heartening to know that you've written a book about the rise of the cyber women. Love the title. Mm. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Look at it. We are all, <laughs> like, all about cyber privacy and all that. But yeah, <laughs> look at from different parts of the world, but mm -hmm. um, also different background, different industry coming into this. Yeah. And yeah. we're all like women power mm -hmm. now. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know what? Yeah, go ahead, Lisa. No, no, it's okay. Go. Oh, no, sorry. Okay, I was just coming. Yeah, I was just going to say that I, I want to take a copy of your book and give it to because we it, it, intelligentsia we we do this um 100 women 100 days cybersecurity career accelerator so we are putting women uh, at no cost to them through the through the training program and you know they we we want them to be successful we want them to 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 have inspiring stories like like the ones that you you collecting lisa and uh, so i i want to give them a copy of your book because i think it's going to keep them going strong right it's a it's a it's it's not an easy journey and it's it doesn't happen overnight mm. um so yeah. so this this will keep them going and and keep them motivated so yeah, yeah i think i'm excited <laughs> you. about your book yeah, and, and the, you'll have to give us the links as well to where to get it it will be definitely. available in the description yeah. of this video yeah. so this video is going to mm -hmm. youtube later on and podcasts yeah. and things like that so we'll do I'll work to try and get a word out, <laughs> but really excited Definitely. for you. Thank you. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. And there will be yes. volume two as well. I've had that much interest that there'll be, I'm going to do a year, hopefully do a yearly volume. So there will be a volume two next year, which will be for, inter, which will be um, released for International Women's Day in March next okay. year. Nice. And then That's every March cool. thereafter. <laughs> yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Carmen, um, then, I was wondering if we could also mention the launch on this Saturday of the Global Risk Express. I was Risk just going to say that. Yeah. Yes, we wanted to get that in. <laughs> I know we are over time, but we, we definitely have to uh, uh, to mention that you're doing the wonderful thing. You organize, um, you organize the big um, e event. Actually, it's multiple sessions, right? There are four or five sessions, and you, you're bringing together all these wonderful speakers um, and experts. Um, uh, they're going to be talking about the global global threats and cyber risks. So, so let me uh, just have you, uh, you know, tell more about that. Sure. The the University of Oklahoma is launching a four part global risk and threat series, and it's starting. We our launch is this uh, Saturday, June sixth. It's with leaders from the intelligence, the finance. Uh, law enforcement uh, and cyber sectors. And the other three sessions are end of June, June 27th, July 18th, 
And I'm not sure in August, we, we haven't put that one together yet, but the very first of these four forums is this pandemic and the risks and impacts of COVID. Uh, it will focus on the latest threats and the trends and how to address the critical issues. Now, this is actually the individuals that are speaking are basically from uh, industry, uh, they are regulators, they are world-renowned leaders that offer real-world solutions. And uh, for our first group, we've got um, Eduardo Aninat, the former Minister of Finance of Chile, and he was a former chairman of the Board of Governors uh, of the World Bank and the IMF. And uh, the, we also have the keynotes are uh, Lou Bledel, who is a former FBI espionage uh, leader. And um, we also have a former FBI assistant general counsel, a former VP of IBM, uh, a FDIC, former FDIC regulator. So a lot of individuals that have held positions uh, regulatory positions and uh, can probably offer us another look, a different look at how to handle some of the challenges that we're facing. Excellent. We will be sharing the links um, in the YouTube description as well so people can feel free to join in. It sounds like amazing, like lots of content and thought leadership. So mm -hmm. very exciting. I know it's going to be amazing. So um, I, I know the, the the type of events that you put together and the type of people you bring together. So I'm I'm looking forward to it. Um, it it's going to be great to um, yeah to listen in for sure. So and we we could talk more and hopefully we will <laughs> do this again, ladies. Yeah. Bring everybody together. <laughs> Yeah, new topics, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah, just just anything we want to chat about. I mean, there's always so much to talk about, right? So yeah. I uh, appreciate your time so much. Likewise. Um, yeah, and appreciate you, Shemaine, and, uh, you know, just uh, <laughs> doing uh, our thing that we do weekly now. So <laughs> I, I love it. Come on. Yeah, all this wouldn't be possible without you as well. And like, mm -hmm. it's because of you, I've got to meet these amazing ladies. And I didn't yes. know that they existed, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm so inspired. <laughs> like just hearing them so and I'm sure like even our communities over here in Australia, Singapore, Japan who will be tuning in to catch up later uh, they will be in amazement because there's so much we I feel like a lot of good insights that have been shared that we could extract mm -hmm. from just today's session alone so yeah really lovely having all of you here today and I know Lisa thank you for waking up so early in the morning no problem <laughs> Yes, you may, you may have to take a nap later on. Yeah. <laughs> I should catch up to you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, that's all we have for today, everyone. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you all at the next episode. So stay tuned. Today. Thank you. Bye. 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 B